Thanks everyone so much for coming out tonight for the screening of Susan Cianciolo's early films. Um, we're super excited to have her here and been, you know, um, fan of hers for a very long time. Um, she has like such a wide range of practice over many years, including like fashion and costumes and kits and zines and books and housewares and also she did a restaurant, run restaurant and art installations and of course films. Um, and um, for a long time um, we've you know, worked with her at the shop at Ooga Booga, um, carrying her zines and clothes and accessories and she did a window, window installation like I don't know how long ago, like eight years ago maybe or something. Um, so it's great to you know come full circle back here tonight and show these early films that she made through um, from 95 to 2000. There's three films. It's um, about 30 minutes runtime total. And um, stick around afterwards because there will be a conversation with Susan and Aaron Rose and so moderated by Sophie von Ulfers. And I'm gonna provide a little bit of information about them before the film so you know more about them. Um, so Susan studied fashion design at Parsons um, and painting at Winchester School of Art. She began her career by interning at Jeffrey Bean under Albert Elbaz. She also worked as production manager for Kim Gordon's ex-girl line and then moved on to assistant collection designer at Bagley Mishka. From 95 to 2001, she produced her critically acclaimed run fashion collection. She had a solo show at Bridget Donahue Gallery last spring in New York, and her work is currently on view in PS1 MoMA's Greater New York Show. This coming January, she will have an exhibition here at 356 Mission Road, so come back for that, please. Um, and then um, Aaron Rose founded Alleged Gallery in New York in the early 90s and ran it for 10 years and was co-curator of the museum exhibition Beautiful Losers and it directed the documentary film of the same name. In 2001, he co-curated Art in the Streets at MoCA Los Angeles. His publishing imprint, Alleged Press, releases hardcover books by contemporary artists including Ari Markopoulos, Ed Templeton, Mike Mills, Barry McGee, and Chris Johansson. Sophie von Ulfers is an independent curator at Museum für Modern Kunst Frankfurt, and also, oh, no, she used to, she, sorry, she's an independent curator who used to curate at Museum for Modern Kunst Frankfurt and at the Wit de Wit Center for Contemporary Art in Water, Rotterdam. And in 2010, she curated the show Not in Fashion at the MMK, focusing on photography and fashion in the 90s. Um, in that show, Susan created a performance for that, um, and had her work featured in many of the photos in the show. Um, from 2010 to 2014, she was chief curator at the Kunsthalle Porticus in Frankfurt, where she organized the Hamlet mise-en-scene, directed by Mark von Schlegel with support from Michael Kreber in the spirit of Jack Smith. For this project, she invited Susan to make costumes and perform in the play as Doctor of Divinity. Susan made a suite of drawings to document this performance, which appear in Sophie's recently published book, Hamlet mise-en-scene, which you can view in the shop next door. Um, thanks so much. Great, thank you, Wendy, thank you, Alex, um, for having us tonight. This is such a great evening, and I feel really privileged to be here with Susan and Aaron. I think this is a rather rare um, occasion and opportunity for all of us to have them share some of their experience and work and life with us tonight. Um, I, I think I would like to start perhaps by attempting to set a little bit of a scenario, which I can only attempt because obviously I wasn't in New York in the 1990s, but um, I'd like to somehow maybe try and set the scene a little bit for you both to fill in all the gaps. Um, so Susan um, was working as a young fashion uh, graduate, designer, artist, um, and you had you know been to school, but I think also was somehow troubled by this fashion world and somehow finding channels how to 
you know, work in, in other ways around the system. And Aaron was at that time mainly busy with a, a project called Alleged, which I think also took a very kind of hybrid form and was a gallery, but was also a film production and was, I think, many more things. So as far as I understand, you both met on the ground of having these interests of working across the field. And I mean, it comes so easily to, I think especially in the art world, to talk of interdisciplinarity and collective practices and cooperation. But I would like somehow to ask you both to maybe talk a little bit about really what this kind of interdisciplinary approach was that you were so very much involved in and practicing at the time in New York. Maybe, I don't know if, if you want to start by talking about how this kind of collaboration between the two of you began and maybe that can lead us on to kind of sprawling out a little bit. I can start and warm you up. <laughs> For those of you who know Susan, she's very soft-spoken. <laughs> um, can I set up how we met very quickly? Um, I, um, I was very good friends with Susan's roommate, Rita Ackerman, who is in two of these films. Um, old, old, old friends. And um, we, we met going to see concerts and things like that, but at the time, around the time when we first met, I was living in uh, Harmony Corinne's apartment on Lafayette and Prince. Um, and I got kicked out of there because I couldn't pay the rent, basically. And Rita was going to Hungary for a long period of time, so she let me stay in her room. And I didn't even barely know you at that point, right? We were like roommates forever. <laughs> um, so when you say multidisciplinary, I don't know if that was a word in the 90s. I think that's a new word. <laughs> it was more just like, um, like we, we, we kind of fell into each other's lives and um, like kind of two complete opposites. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we were married for quite a long time as well, um, which we no longer are, but thank God. <laughs> Our relationship is so much better. <laughs> now, that you, now that you don't work together anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and what was the... Now, um, now she can chime in. And what was the, um, what was the alleged, alleged project um, kind of exactly, or roughly? <laughs> well, we met, alleged, alleged was a gallery, but it was also just a multi, like, you know, I say multidisciplinary because I've learned that word since, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a place where people got together and created things. And one of the things that was so interesting about Susan to me was that she thought in the same way. It's like her approach to, yeah, she was coming off of fashion, and I believe you were working at X Girl, or you had just left X Girl at that point. Um, and you're slightly disillusioned with the couture world. You're with Badgley Mishka, and you're with Jeffrey Bean, and kind of that world was kind of killing you. And you were looking for something new and decided to start a line. And what we were doing over there was kind of the same idea where it's like you just, you don't wait for anyone to tell you it's okay to do it and you just do it. And, and right around that time was when Susan, I think you had done one collection before we met. I had two collections. The, because I feel like we were doing totally different work, but there was this, like you said, this one common ground, I guess. But I, when I met you, I had made the first collection at Andrea Rosen that Rita and Bernadette had helped me with, and then the second collection that was at a parking garage. Oh, yeah. and we had just met, and he was the security guard at, oh, yeah. at that show. 
and that was in an abandoned parking lot in Chelsea. And and then when you moved in Rita's, you started a film company, and I took sort of a similar approach to those shows that I was doing and did the performance down. Right. That was the first yeah. collaboration. Wall you had that show in Wall Street, and so I tried some kind of performance where Phil Frost was painting the model in front of people, and I had hair and makeup. So the whole thing happened while the opening was going on, which was very strange. And, and then we decided to start making films in um, Rita's studio. And so that's how it all started. And the, and the, um, that was the sorry. first film that was shown, pro-abortion and I think. Yeah, where you invited uh, a number of photographers to work on moving image um, films with you. I, I, I'd like to also just, because um, I find that such a great somehow analogy to how you work, Susan, and and probably also how Aaron, you were kind of practicing at the at the time, or maybe still are. I don't really know your work today that well. I know Susan's better, but this run collection, as far as I understand it, <coughs> has in fact very little to do with the idea of collection as we understand it in the fashion world of the different seasons, but it kind of plays much more on the idea of collecting or assembling a group of people who come together and actually create work together, which, you know, I think you've, you've had this kind of run through your whole practice with this word run in combination with different plays of games. And um, I think this first one, this run collection that somehow like hovers above there somehow as an umbrella, you know, sums this, this kind of philosophy of, of working up perfectly because it just means that, you know, whoever was kind of working around you guys and with you, whether they were visual artists or musicians or filmmakers and, you know, uh, technicians and, you know, everyone was good people who cook. I mean, you made a restaurant as a project. I mean, the, there's endless kind of forms that this, this kind of collection has taken on over the years. And I think that, that somehow is such a kind of brilliant <laughs> way of entering into somehow this fashion world while rejecting it also at the same time. Have you ever thought of that? Well, <laughs> what exactly? I've never thought about the fact of run collection as a meaning like of a co Gallery. collection of, of talents and... Well, I looked, I always looked at it as meaning collective. Like collection was just a long version I'd, of a collection of people. But Run started beforehand when I met Rita and Bernadette and w that way we were working in the group and they asked, what's the name of what you do? And, I, and it was Run. So then I brought that name with me when I opened the collection. But to me, it was a collection every season. And it was a collective of people. But it was only that in between the seasons, there would be a bunch of other things that would be happening, like that first film, Pro-Abortion, was a combination of the first few collections, and then that got shown, officially screened on the th the third collection. And and did you? I mean, would the two of you um, conceive these these projects together? Because it's, it's produced by Aaron, directed by Susan, and then you would invite the photographers, and then you would facilitate, or you would actually would there be meetings? Would there be like, or would you just kind of? 
go ahead and well, do them? Well, we, and yeah, we just what stayed up we all night together. and made, made <laughs> films and just worked. You did make a time. screenplay, though, that I just oh, re that, yeah, that um, exists somewhere in like a single copy. Are you, do you have those original drawings still? Yeah, I have she, some of the original drawings left, but all she the produced screen a screenplay that gone. was all visual, but it was like 200 pages of drawings so for pro-abortion. I spent a summer drawing each scene, but they didn't really make sense. And then there's writings, and then that's how we made the film, kind of. But in a way, it was. I feel I invited some people that I liked and you invited some people and then it all got merged together and, and then he gave me a Super 8 camera and said, just start shooting and and then your friend Maggie had an editing suite and so it just all, we just were, was working on it all the time. And the, the, the kind of conditions I guess were so different um, back then. How were you? How old were you actually around that time? Like in your twenty-three or something. Mid twenties, yeah. yeah, early twenties. Twenty-five, twenty-six. Were we? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm more like helping Aaron and yeah. <laughs> and Susan to remember. I don't remember a lot of the nineties. Or to remind <laughs> each other. <laughs> I guess it's, yeah. It's like yeah. I mean, that's twenty years ago. Um, but there was a there was for for pro abortion there was um, there was an overall brief that we gave to each filmmaker or each photographer they weren't most of the people were not filmmakers actually um, that came directly from Susan's screenplay as abstract as that screenplay was and it was really abstract like it didn't look like a screenplay at all it was just a portfolio of drawings but there were there were themes and we we chose I think who should do. You know, like Mar we said Marcelo should do the, do the operation, operation and, and Terry should do the rape and like Chris should do the rope, the mm -hmm. crazy ropes, which by the way, that was, I don't know if you remember, but like that, we shot that outside the Javits Center in New York. Like, I don't know if you guys know where that is, but we had no permit. Um, we just showed up there and strung all those ropes. <laughs> And just looked for cops. We had lookouts, didn't we? <laughs> like, yeah. and just made the girls climb out into the ropes and hang on those ropes. And that was Julian Laverdier that did that. Mm -hmm. Who did? Um, he did the Ground Zero lights. You know, the lights that shoot up into the um, sky from where the uh, Twin yeah. Towers were. Julian did those later. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> he was our gaffer. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, the, that that piece, the the one with the ropes, was really nice for me to see because that photographer Chris Moore, he was in that same exhibition that Susan was that we did together in Frankfurt, and um, and he um, he's played a really important role in in your work, and and you said earlier that I think like a lot of the imagery that's been produced over the you know the years and that make up a lot of your archive. Um, the majority of those images are by Chris, um, and um, and I like I like the fact that you've always been extremely open with everyone who's been involved in in your practice, which I think at the time there were also different approaches about you know for example Bernadette Corporation I think approached it very differently and it was a much more conceptual kind of approach about getting rid of authorship and somehow, you know, also collaborating, but the facing names and somehow, you know, having this kind of, well, corporation as a kind of, you know, kind of strategic conceptual entity. And, um, and I think you somehow always like freestyled much more and somehow went, were not afraid to kind of drift and into different directions all the time. Well, I, I remember there was a point where I felt I realized that my style was so much different than Bernadette's and I really could feel myself going in a, a different direction, but I still feel like I learned so much 
from the time in collaborating with her. I remember specifically when she would write, like we'd write manifestos. I remember there was specific things though that I still continued. And then I feel it was also the same and when we really went separate ways and not collaborating anymore. It's kind of like an education in a sense of, for me, how to use the medium of film. Because then after, as I've continued making films, they're so different. The, um, Aaron, Aaron went through his archive and brought some pretty amazing documents with him. <laughs> that I think we should, we should share. <laughs> At least, maybe as far as we can. I mean, one page, uh, and you guys don't really, I mean, this was apparently made before the pro-abortion film was made as a kind of synopsis, uh, perhaps also maybe to fundraise. Yeah, that's how we would get sponsorship, which was mostly from Shiseido. From great the beginning. To see like a four paragraph you know, sheet that you could like hand out to people um, explaining somehow what this, what this project was about. And then, um, which, you know, is, is a much more slim version of what we have today when we have to kind of hand in these funding applications that, you know, <laughs> are pretty yeah. like more like, like this. You know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and you don't even know if you can really believe what you read at all. And then the you should other feel the same way about that document. <laughs> you should feel the same. <laughs> yeah. You also don't know what it is. I mean, it, it makes really no means. sense to me. We wrote it. But. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to read it out? Yeah, then? read it. Come I on. Don't, I don't know. It's so Come embarrassing. On. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Does anyone want to read this? No. Yes. But you, you wrote this, though. No, I, yes, you did. <laughs> no, you wrote, I'm going to give you all the credit. <laughs> okay. Pro-abortion, a fashion film. And the title actually came from Harmony because I wanted a title that was very subversive. So, But the final title was Pro-abortion, Anti-Pink. So it says a fashion film written and directed by Susan Cianciolo, produced by Aaron Rose Alleged Films, synopsis. In the interest of forging new paths in all visual mediums, particularly in the world of fashion, we are pleased to introduce pro-abortion. <laughs> pro-abortion will mark the directorial debut from Susan Cianciolo, one of the one of New York's most watched young faces in the fashion world. The, the film, which is based on a screenplay written by Cianciolo, will run approximately 30 minutes in length and will feature a retrospective of her past designs as well as introduce her new spring-summer collection. Pro-abortion will be shot on Super 8 16 millimeter and video and will consist of a series of short individual segments shot and visualized by a diverse group of the most groundbreaking photographers, cinematographers working today. Each of these segments will be bookmarked by film montages utilizing graphic treatments and images by Cianciolo. The primary theme of pro-abortion will be a concise study of movement this will be realized by the documentation of individuals in her daily minute-by-minute -minute routines while interacting with life, fashion, and beauty situations explored will include the acts of changing clothes, eating, having beauty makeovers and operations, shopping, sex, and rape, transportation, and conversation. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> And Aaron found the invitations, which this was a second screening that we did on at Andrea Rosen on Prince Street. Yeah. The first one was at Showroom Seven, and it showed my third collection. And we had No Neck Blues play first, and then Julian built a rope set where th there was some kind of maze performance. So usually they were made to show in conjunction with 
some kind of performance, not in the way that they're shown now, just on their own. So there would be the 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 designs and the, or the, the pieces from the collections would also be presented at these yeah. events together yeah. with the films. But Susan always eschewed the the runway format. It was only like later when you started to like get attention that you started doing runway. Um, but the collections were always presented um, in a performance art medium. They were they were like like the in Ontex film the the girls serving chocolates that was at a tea house on University Place right in Gramercy yeah in, Gra yeah, in Gramercy Park um, and the models came out and um, I mean they weren't even models they were our friends but um, and served everybody tea and chocolates and like for that one they were the 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 actors had to negotiate these very tangled ropes and walk very awkwardly through these tangled ropes. It was not an easy job. And there was one where um, the models were all asleep. And then there were also dummies that Susan had built mixed in with them that were wearing the clothes that were just like stuffed, basically stuffed pillowcases, basically wearing the clothes. So that you had real people and then these stuffed people all lying on the ground asleep. And they had to sleep for like an hour while people walked through them and looked at the clothes. That was in, in Paris. And there was a film of um, women sleeping in different, it was a silent film in different abandoned, like abandoned warehouse or in the park that Annette Arell had made. And, and then you could put on Walkmans and listen to uh, different like pieces of music that friends gave and um, also yes, talking on there. It was just you'd put on different soundtracks. I forgot it's about funny. that. I totally ripped you off like five years later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is a great idea <laughs> for something. We won't talk about what it was. So the, 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 that restaurant scene in, in the film, in the Zero film, that was... That was public, her fashion show. Yeah, but, and so that was a public that was already there that you somehow hijacked with the, with the waitresses? Or no, was it, we, we rented that tea house okay, and okay. then so you people came for the, the show okay, and yeah. we made the chocolates in my studio the day before. It was a family recipe, so we, that was whole, that was the whole thing was. Yours was, or Antex? <laughs> mine. Yours. <laughs> but then that was his idea to use that scene, those scenes in, in the, the film. In the actual film. Yeah, because this is the, it's the second document here, which is also pretty great. It's a budget uh, by Antek Waltak sent to Susan in preparation of this uh, third film that we saw. It says, Susan, this is the budget for internal use only. <laughs> <laughs> Give the next page to creative time. This figure can drop a couple of hundred if I don't do better. Let's see how much you can get before deciding. Uh, the total budget, $838. <laughs> And this is pretty amazing because he, um, I mean, I don't want to be like cynical about it, but it's such a uh, humble budget, and <laughs> you know that film got made and it's there, and you know there's a contingency of seventy-seven dollars <laughs> in case I go over budget. <laughs> it's so good, you know, and so sincere, and you know, I'm sure you did it with less than the $838, because I don't know if Creative sure. Time gave you money, but I probably not. I don't know, I, I would yeah. think maybe not, so he probably had to do it with less. <laughs> yeah. You know, which is like, you know, the, these, so nice to see this, you know, that, that, uh, that, that work gets done, you know, and 
That brings up an interesting point. I mean, I mean, pretty I much know. all of these films were made for free. Like, you, we never, there were no budgets. Like, it wasn't like we would go to a filmmaker and say, we have this much money to do this. Like, nobody got paid. It was, they were all done for free. Even on tech, like, for whatever that was, it was, I'm sure it was, um, he probably didn't see anything or whatever. We just had, um, we had friends that were doing things on tech. Um, the first, Maggie's film was not edited there, but uh, pro-abortion and Run With Zeros were actually edited in the back of AFA, American Fine Arts, in Soho, when it still existed. On tech had a... Um, pro-abortion was, I edited pro-abortion You didn't Maggie. do it there? No, oh, I right, okay. editing studio. Really? At her uncle's okay. studio, beca because you remember he made Style Wars. Right, okay, sorry. Disregard that. <laughs> Susan has a better memory than me. Well, Ontec was editing, and maybe maybe the third one, but Ontec's editing suite was was in the back of Collins Gallery, and it was an old tape. It was before digital. It was tape tape editing. And then, and how far do you observe that changing over the years since since then? Like, do you feel that there's a certain kind of um, I don't know, like it almost like you, you, you know, you need a certain level of production for work to even be taken seriously or to even get support? Or do you, do you feel well, like I feel people... I like that's very different questions for us. Yeah, I guess I because... I feel like my, my films are still made the in same this way. kind of way, and, but you're in a very different kind of film. Well, I think for me it now. just depends on the film. You know, I mean, I, I, I make films for a living now, and I have projects that are quite well-funded and, and, and big, but I still make films for zero dollars. In fact, my favorite films are zero dollars. You know, um, that usually it's like me getting together with some friends for an afternoon and shooting something that come out the best. And the rest of the, you know, and I've learned that really young, you know, and, you know, as you get older, you move into different echelons of life, and you think, or people tell you things, that certain things are more important than others, and you know this. Um, and you go along with the game because your life has changed, and, you know, you have a family to support, and you have things to do, or whatever, but the, the best things are still free. It's such a cliche, but it's true, you know? Underfunded is usually ideal. You know, which is something kind of. Can I talk about what I talked to you right after the Ontex film? Yes. There's a lot of when we were before the screening, we were talking upstairs, and these guys were talking about how Ontex is like a bit of a profit. And I know Ontex really well, and I was kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> like maybe close, but you know, he's just Ontex. Um, but after watching the film. There are so many interesting premonitions well, in that plus film. You haven't seen it for a long time. I haven't time seen it in I recently 15 years. It yeah. Um, and, but Susan brought up that Ground Zero references, and this was, he made that film in 1999. Um, there were so many interesting premonitions with like, even with the welders on the bridge and just kind of like images that we, that we, that we now think of like as iconic 9-11 images that were kind of, there were premonitions in that film. But also, um, that was um, the, when he went into Barney's and was shooting, and I remember that was quite a production to allow him to get into Barney's to shoot. Um, her season's collection on the racks in Barney's, um, and then all the limousines, and then and, and your voiceover, and I don't remember exactly what you're saying in that voiceover, but it's really quite poignant. That was very much a premonition of you, say, of you giving up on the fashion world, of you like, you know, he was filming that kind of, that was kind of like your, like what would be a young designer's dream to have their own, you know, micro store in Barney's New York, which for you, that was a breaking point, which is kind of interesting just as a follow up to that in terms of like, what's, what are you making things for? Are you making them to be in Barney's? Or are you making them to be good? You know, and it's very interesting that that film, I like, my heart kind of sank when I watched that because I knew exactly what happened after that. Very interesting. Yeah, I was looking at it more as him being a prophet for more 
you know, premonitions of the world. Not I wasn't including But he myself, was looking at you. That was, yeah, I mean, he <laughs> in working with him on that, it, it was so touching because he went, he was so involved in, you know, in just in the studio every day. Is mm -hmm. But you must have shared a lot of these kind of conflicts with that industry and that kind of world with him also. So I'm, I guess well, for that... For a long, long time, yeah. yeah. So this was probably a I mean, kind of way to... that's why I love that film so much. give form to like a shared, you know, yes. conflict of... Obviously, of yeah, of, of over some all sort. those years. And I mean, that that's a, that's a great observation that that's somehow like, you know, where you then made a certain decision, but... I think also like this kind of battle that you were like kind of going back to making you know work that could sell and be kind of sold as collections or be kind of marketed as collections and like that like went on right I mean that that went on over the years as a, like you said you know you have to somehow you know make a living and I remember like this conversation that we've had about this and somehow like you know attempting to find always like new channels of perhaps this could be interesting, perhaps working with this person could be interesting, perhaps, you know, getting support from these people could be a new way of approaching it and making like a line or making like, uh, how do you call, call it, like, well, producing like a line. Like you've, you've tried doing that many times to then again somehow like fail at it again or like reject it over and over again which is like that's also a process I think that very much makes up your work right this kind yeah, of I, f I feel lucky that it failed for sure and then Wendy mentioned the restaurant and that was like a good celebration and you know the ending of it the closing yeah. this was the restaurant that you did as a project in in the gallery yeah. right yeah yeah, which I found a shirt from it in a box in my garage, and I washed it to wear tonight. And run restaurant. <laughs> which ran for how long? The a, month. a month. A month. It was yeah. like an official exhibition. And then whenever you kind of made these things, and there would be kind of designs or pieces to go with it and people could buy them and people could someone like take something with them. I always found that also something that is, is, um, is, is something that must have allowed you a lot of freedom too to kind of make these things and also sell them and like sell them at prices that you believe that should be sold at and not kind of slotting into you know a market in that sense and because you've always done that. You've like whether also recently they've been like more of these, what, what, what were they, these kind of, they were not restaurant nights, but they were like food nights or like pop-up restaurant nights where people could come and like eat for like $30 and there would be like, but, and the, somehow I... $250. 200 <laughs> and, and run, run restaurant bankrupted Sorry. us. <laughs> <laughs> run restaurant bankrupted us. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fantastic idea. These we had a blast, <laughs> but like, we didn't make These a dime. This is the more recent, like the last couple, like last three, four years ones. They were two hundred fifty dollars a night. A person, yeah. I must have misread, but I guess that was. <laughs> and that, and that broke even. But, but that's great. But um, I guess what I <laughs> what I wanted to say is that. There's never been this issue about like putting a, somehow like a certain price to something either, you know, whether it's 30 or 250, <laughs> doesn't really matter. But like, you know, that's somehow like, it's always there, it's like it was on the, you know, it would be like on the invite, like there'd be like a price written down, like this is something that I think uh, with like, in this kind of classic uh, art context is somehow like, strangely taboo or people don't like make use of it you know people don't make use that they can break even with certain project and say like you know this is 250 dollars or 30 and but you know we can like actually make something make something happen and we can it's th that always struck me like when i look at your invitations and things like that like that's always something that just kind of it's like a stamp with it you know like a 
prize I'm, or tag. I mean, or I guess because it was a, it's always been a self-produced studio. Is that what you mean? Well, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. It just kind of came, came to my mind. Like it's just an observation, really, that there's a kind of openness dealing with that aspect of like breaking even, making money, making the money that you need to like produce the work and being very frank about it and like I'm thinking that that point. has given you also a lot of freedom in the way that you work. Yes, I could always do yeah, whatever I wanted, that freedom. But there was a ridiculous amount of labor involved. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about it before, I mean Susan's fingers would bleed regularly from sewing, from hand sewing. I mean, she, you had assistants later on, you had a couple of assistants working for you, but I mean, like bloody purple, you said, <laughs> like purple fingers from sewing, you know, like serious, serious work went into all of it, from the, the films to the clothes to the productions, like the presentations, it was, yeah, it's an inhuman amount of work. Yeah, I can't, I can't do it in that way anymore. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you um, <laughs> how how it's where it got to now. Um, you know, if there's because you if there's kind of if it's more about the images and less about the objects or less about the kind of production. I I don't think so. I, I just spent the summer making a film, and and I, to me, it was this just about the same amount of work as then, still making the the costumes and shooting in it and whatever you you, you do, you edit, shoot, you're in it, producing it, um, but because I still love I still love making films or the performances, all of it. I don't feel like it's it's changed very much, but when I look back, it was an extraordinary amount of work that we produced that was very inhuman that I, I feel like that's the difference. I couldn't match that amount. But it was, you know, it was tw 20 years ago. But you also kind of did it for 20 years in a way. I mean, the, you know, I think when we met a few, like maybe six years ago, you were working like that also. So, you know, maybe there's, there's a point now that where you can somehow, you know, navigate to a, a, a certain way of working and maybe, you know, produce less which I think you would probably like, but you've produced like on a pretty intense like scale and like in I mean, a I very still do. I just feel like you're not supposed to really talk about it that much and say, I'm a workaholic or <laughs> like I love to work all the time, but I just, because I feel like you're supposed to just pretend you don't work that much. And yeah, it's but true. You're just supposed yeah, to you're relax. supposed to act like you're just like <laughs> chilling all the time <laughs> yeah. and this stuff gets but made. But that's just what I like to do. <laughs> It's just what I do. Maybe we should. Um, is there, are there any questions from from anyone at this point? Perhaps you want to ask Susan or Aaron something that I'm forgetting. Something that's interesting or important to ask. You guys, it, maybe it would be fun how you were telling those few shows. You know, the few, the processes of those collections. That if you went, because there was, what, 10 shows? How many runs were there? 10? 11. 11? You said like the first three or four. Will you say what, do you remember what the other ones were? You had the run store, you had the restaurant, like with the rope performance. And it seems like each one had its own kind of unique, interesting. Well, run five was at Purple Paris for the sleepers. Mm -hmm. um, run six was this film, Diodal, and we, we showed that 
in New York at the Rotunda Theater, and some members of Nonek played with Rita and performed outside in this circular circular theater. This beautiful theater. outdoor amphitheater on the Upper West Side called the Rotunda, which is now is so underused, it's ridiculous. And I'm not sure what happened at run four. <laughs> I can't remember right now. <laughs> That's but probably a good sign. <laughs> yeah, <maybe>. Thanks. <laughs> run seven was an alleged book, the run seven book. And we got a deal with Japan that they would print um, a thousand copies. And so we did the opening first at Andrea Rosen and it and she had Wolfgang Tillman's pictures up. So I did a, found these broken mannequins at Pucci and some broken mannequins from Sotheby's and the photographs were in the background. And, and then we had a flea market style in one room with the books and performances of the kits, which is now what I just showed in New York, the, the continuum of those kits. And then we went to Japan and showed it at 360 Gallery. Run 8 was the show that Antek showed in his film. Um, Run 9 was called Structures, and that was at Alleged Gallery. And it was also this open forum where anyone in the world could make an animal. Oh, <laughs> Do yeah. you remember that? And just bring an animal in, of any kind and drop it off. I think you can just made, add it to the show. <laughs> I'm just bringing it. Because <laughs> some people brought giant animals or you didn't know what was coming. And then Run 10 was a traditional runway show at Andrea's new gallery in Chelsea. And, and then I decided to put all the embroidery and handwork on the inside so the outside looked like it was very tailored. And Run 11 was the store that you shot that picture of and you put up the scaffolding at that abandoned storefront. And then we went to Paris and did it for one or two days in Paris at Purple and then Run Restaurant. And that was it. What was Run for? <laughs> we were there. Is that pro-abortion? No. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> there was a collection in there. Do you mean the, the, the kits, um, the, des the designed kits? Yeah. Or the ones that were on display recently at the... At, during Run 7, there was a series of kits made um, that were some like with wood and muslin, some with just muslin, and it's a, like a, some kind of abstract lug luggage that or box that has contains things. And then uh, we reintroduced it again at Run 11 where we called them do-it-yourself kits, but that's where it started at run six. It was this denim oversized skirt that comes with scissors and pins and you can cut it up for yourself. And I kept reintroducing it until people were interested. And then at run 11, there was an aversion of, you know, 10 or 15 kinds of kits that were based off of that do-it-yourself kit of the denim and then a recent show I had in New York was some of those older kits with versions of, over the last six, seven years, versions of those kits that I had been making, mostly for a show in New York and some shows in Japan. And then I expanded on it. Originally in Run Collection, yeah. The do-it-yourself denim skirt was like a huge seller for you at run from run six and it came in a, a plastic bag right it was yeah and it was 
like wrapped. It was wrapped, and it was it a, had a yeah, muslin all, everything bag you needed to make it. Scissors and they were yeah producing them in like multiples. It sold for fifty dollars, and I found it at a closeout warehouse, the oversized skirt, and then when people started ordering them, I bought out the warehouse, and we just stacked them. <laughs> yeah. so we, we just got s so many orders. It's, yeah. it's crazy. And I forgot that you didn't even make the skirt. <laughs> In those kits, there's all different archives from the Run collection from that time. And there's new things that my daughter has made with me, um, new things I've made, cost costumes from different films. Sometimes there's a, a film inside the kit playing or holograms. There, sometimes they're abstract, like ge geometric objects. They're, they're all different. Sometimes they're kits that are like a whole outfit kit. And they, they will be on show here in January also, I believe, yeah. Um, which that's great. This kind of and and they they also d an assemblage in a way of like archival material and new work. So I think you, as Susan, I think rarely kind of keeps like an existing piece like on its own there as a kind of archival precious piece. I mean, you, you like to work and rework things and put them in a new context and, 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 and hence this kind of presentation, which I've not seen in New York, so I'm excited to see it here. It seems, seems to be a really interesting way for you to somehow reassemble things on a constant basis and find a way how to take existing work and new work and Combine the two. Any other comments or questions to these two people? <laughs> Is there anything you want to say that I forgot to ask? Or that comes to mind still that you'd like to share something Aaron about Susan or Susan about Aaron I mean I'd, I'd like <laughs> to express gratitude to this space here for showing these films I've never been here before this is a cool place um, and um, it's really nice that um, it's just nice to see these films again it's been you know you can imagine looking back at work I mean now you feel the same it's like looking back at work that you made so long ago and through the eyes of being older and wiser and better, hopefully better. Um, and you have to kind of accept it on its own terms in a setting like this. It's a great gift, I think, for both of us, especially, for, uh, certainly for me. So I'd like to end with that one. I wanted to say that Aaron introduced Wendy and I together to each other. So I'm just so, so grateful for that, but grateful to Wendy because We've made a lot of special shows here over the years, and I feel so lucky to to come back now. I haven't been in a long time and make some work here because I love it here. But and but watching this old work is it's very intense for me because they were a part of other projects. But I feel fortunate that I got to make that work. It, it doesn't seem real now lo looking back but, but thank you so much for coming thank you thank you thanks <laughs>